This is a webcast recording for modern European history. This webcast is discussing SI5 working class for the Industrial Revolution unit. As you can see here on this slide, uh, we have the list of subtopics that are highlighting some of the textbook material uh, describing working class realities during the Industrial Revolution. At the bottom uh, is that bold question, what is life like for the working class? You should be able to answer that question with some particular facts and insight following the discussion of SI5. So the first point to be made here is that the working class is not all alike. Um, there are some diversity and variations of working class uh, jobs and, and working class uh, life experience. So you can see that some of the working class in Europe would be um, the industrial work labor force uh, working in these uh, new factories and industries that the Industrial Revolution is producing. Uh, some of them are artisans uh, in the working class. These are the, the holdovers from the old life. Uh, the ones that are really um, having a hard time um, handling the transition from uh, a life in which goods were made by hand to now goods made by machine. So uh, they're going to very much struggle uh, both in income and also just kind of an emotional and a mental uh, acceptance for the new changes of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you also have some working class people that will work in homes as domestic servants and of course you have some peasants or laborers out in the agricultural lands. So not everybody in the work working class is exactly alike. Certainly not everybody in the working class worked in factories, although that becomes more and more common. Working class families, pretty much a typical uh, expectation is that everybody in the family is going to work. So that it would include children. Um, the, the point of this is because uh, husbands and wives collectively don't make enough money to survive on. So uh, their children who are of proper age, and this would be quite young, uh, would uh, look for work to be able to supplement mom and dad's income. So child labor is a, a fairly significant issue in the Industrial Revolution. Um, one particular industry um, that hired children uh, was coal mining. Uh, coal mining industry used children because they're smaller and could fit into uh, tight uh, spaces. Uh, that would be indicative of the underground coal mining reality. Uh, but of course, as you can see in the picture, uh, there are children even working in other factories such as this uh, spinning factory. At a certain point, people are going to start to be concerned that uh, children uh, are working uh, long hours uh, during the day and, of course, really not receiving uh, the benefits of education. Uh, so you'll start to see governments passing laws that will start to restrict uh, children labor, such as in 1833, uh, the parliament in Great Britain passed some labor reform laws that started to restrict uh, industries from employing children. And the interesting thing about this is that some of the, the greatest protesters of these laws were from the working class. And that was because uh, these labor reform laws um, restricted their income. So for a time, you saw some of the working class really not looking favorably to the child reform laws. But over time, we see these reform laws as being uh, a needy and uh, a positive response to the social problems of child labor. Uh, women, of course, were in the labor force. Uh, oftentimes, employers would like to uh, employ women because they could uh, be paid uh, a lower wage. Um, also, sometimes just the, the mentality of women, uh, they were more compliant in the workplace. And so for men who might, um, as you can see in the three examples there, they might have uh, more propensity for alcohol abuse, they might actually not uh, follow orders or be insubordinate more common than women, or men were even uh, more interested in unionizing, which uh, anybody running a factory 
uh, wouldn't want any kind of radical union presence uh, in their labor force. And so uh, women uh, would be favored over men to be able to uh, have a workforce that that would inc not include these unwanted uh, negative influences. Uh, interesting thing that uh, people started to notice, uh, doctors uh, started to identify that uh, working class uh, babies, we're talking about women that were um, pregnant and then having babies, and these people would be of the working class uh, socioeconomic level, uh, that their babies were more prone to uh, illness. And so there became a question that perhaps maybe we need to uh, protect women in the workforce. Uh, and so you start to see uh, reform laws also restricting uh, the, the types of industries that women could work in as well as the amount of hours they could work a day. Uh, domestic life, of course, uh, is, a, is a difficult one because uh, not only are the men and women and children working, but then they come home and they have to kind of care for themselves. So um, there's, no, there's no help other than the, the people within the household to take care of the cooking and the mending and, and all the chores necessary in a family life. And, you know, they, they returned to homes that were um, not luxurious. So some people lived uh, with a certain standard that would be adequate, uh, but others just lived in absolute poverty. So there would be a diversity of working class home life. As you can see there, the, uh, the uh, domestic life third dash, uh, child mortality is the child death rate. Um, up to the age of five was extremely high. In some places, you could see mortality rates up at 50%, which is uh, is is startling. Um, so clearly, uh, life expectancy for the working class uh, was not was not positive. And in the last uh, quote, there you can see an observer of uh, a European nation um, saying that. The working class children almost were universally ill looking, small, sickly, barefoot, ill clad, and degenerate or immoral race. So, a lot of negative associations there to uh, the working class, which speak to both a reality and also uh, certain stereotypes that the working class would have to uh, deal with from other people that were um, from a more well-to-do rank in society. Working class conditions, you can see it's described in your book as being harsh, brutal, and short. Um, harsh, uh, of course, you know, and, and brutal also just dealing with the, uh, the difficult labor conditions and short, just alluding to the, uh, the life expectancy of the working class um, it, it is, is difficult because the work conditions uh, put so much strain uh, on the body and, and uh, the hazardous worst conditions you know can bring injury or death. The working day was was long. 14 to 16 hour days was not unusual and uh, working every day of the week. Sometimes employers might give off uh, the day of Sunday for uh, Sabbath rest, but um, it was not unusual to work seven days straight. Uh, worker abuse, uh, a lot of uh, intimidation just to, you know, overseers trying to encourage their workforce uh, to be able to be as productive as possible. So mental and physical abuse is not uncommon. And of course the uh, work conditions very unsafe. Um, a lot of on-the-job injuries. Um, work now regulated by the clock. That's an interesting factor, kind of dealing with the whole change of time and space of the Industrial Revolution, that the clock becomes much more prominent in life. So if you're working a 14-hour shift, you're gonna, that shift is going to start and end at the, the blow of a whistle, which is all regulated by a uniform timekeeping. Um, so now everything is, is you know, the, the is regimented, you know, we're, we're, we're counting hours and minutes and seconds now, as opposed to being regulated um, by the sun, which is a little bit more subjective and, and slower seemingly passage of time. Um, now the clock is going to get becoming a, a preeminent uh, element of society. 
And then, of course, another work condition issue that we want to address is, is the artisans, the artisans struggling uh, to adapt and, and see the, the, the change or uh, uh, supporting the change from hand goods to machine-made goods. I'll talk more about that issue in a minute, but here we have just a collage of images, just kind of taking some snapshots, giving you some working class uh, job conditions uh, scenarios and just just kind of scan those you can see uh, young people uh, older people sometimes the young and older people working together you can see the the boy top right hand corner the spinning machine uh, no shoes um, people carrying uh, heavier loads um, you know it's, it's a very diverse mix of, of what type of jobs are available in the industrial revolution um, but by and large we're de dealing with uh, a very difficult uh, working class reality. The Luddites uh, get their name from General Ludd, uh, which is a fictional character um, that kind of inspired the, the working class artisans uh, who didn't like the fact that uh, technology was beginning to minimize their employment uh, wage earning uh, capability. And so you can see in the picture here, uh, uh, gentlemen that are starting to smash tools with sledgehammers. So they were called the Luddites, these people, these artisans. Uh, they're, the, there's various episodes throughout Europe where artisans kind of took matters into their own hand um, and, and kind of violently responded to the innovations and changes uh, of, and use of technology in the Industrial Revolution. So we have a couple examples of just uh, riots and insurrections. Um, and then, of course, those are followed up and responded to by governments who use equal force to uh, put these riots and insurrections down. So we, we, we get some tension uh, within uh, the people and the governments, uh, the people that have power and the people that are, are poor and, and, and working class. Um, so we can kind of see some... Uh, some ongoing tensions, as we saw maybe in the French Revolution or in the Arab Spring. Blue Mondays, so this is a term, you even hear people talk about this still today, but not necessarily in, in the same sense. But Blue Mondays were a nonviolent way in which workers can kind of show their displeasure in the workplace. Um, and it, the, the Blue Monday strategy is simply not showing up for work on a Monday. If you're given the Sabbath Sunday day off, uh, you well, Blue Monday would be, um, you know, not showing up for the next day of work. Um, not as violent and not as uh, radical as the Luddites, but you know, could could be something that might catch uh, employers' attention if you were trying to demonstrate uh, a need for wage increase or better working conditions. The problem with this is that employers had absolutely no uh, need to justify firing you. If, if, you, if they found uh, any displeasure with you, they just put you on the street and fire, fire you and, and, and bring somebody else in to take your place. So a Blue Monday didn't necessarily effectively bring about any type of, uh, of change. A, a radical uh, step in protest would be a labor strike. And so this is more organized than a, a Blue Monday not showing up for work. Uh, a labor strike is a refusal to work. And this is done uh, when a group of workers on a particular workplace or an in industry decide collectively together, uh, universally, that they are not going to work, which of course hurts the uh, the employer of the business, uh, the profits are going to uh, uh, be impacted, particularly if the labor strike uh, goes on for an indefinite amount of time, and this might bring the owner of a factory or a business to some negotiating table and some type of compromise on whatever the laborers are looking for, whether that's improved wages or improved working conditions. As you can see, the picture on the right, uh, we do have a a labor strike being identified in this um, sketch, but it also shows you um, kind of the the confrontation between labor strikers 
who are not working uh, in the mill, but they're protesting outside of the mill, and then a a group of people that are armed that have been hired by the employer to go in and uh, break up the strikers to uh, to use violence to to uh, uh, prohibit and to try to discourage the strikers. So there's a there's a strong clash here of wills between the working class and then the uh, and the and the owners of these uh, businesses to to uh, to either enact a, a strike or to try to prevent one. So imagine this uh, this scene here. You have a, a worker guy in the suit and a laborer um, up there in the top right hand corner, symbolized by the guy and the working class tool hammer. You know, if, if a guy, uh, a single laborer came to the boss and said, hey, I've been working for some time for you, I, I really would like to see my wage increased. Or if you had a certain problem that you wanted to address in the workplace, maybe it's a hazard uh, in the workplace that you would like to see addressed. Uh, what would often happen is that worker would just be dismissed, fired on the spot. And so that didn't bring about much change. Usually people were silenced all right, and didn't uh, try to, um, you know, ask for any type of change or do anything that was disruptive. And what starts to happen uh, in the Industrial Revolution to support the workers is an attempt to unionize. So if one worker can't make change by negotiating one-on-one -on -one with the employer, what would happen if you start to add workers to that negotiation? And this is the formulation of trade unions or unions. And so unions are organizations um, that uh, collectivize uh, workers in a particular industry or at a particular workplace. And they advocate on behalf of the workers to try to improve working conditions uh, or, or uh, wages. And so as a mass of workers, they have much more leverage to be able to Im improve wages and working con conditions than if they were just operating by themselves. So unions become quite popular during this time. Of course, workers, uh, or I should say, the owners of factories hate unions and they would like to see those uh, broken up and disbanded. Um, but, but unions will start to uh, become a growing movement in the Industrial Revolution. And of course, one of the union's great strategies to bring leverage in negotiations is the labor strike. So one of the last measures uh, in, in um, uh, the fight for working wages and, and better improved working conditions is a labor strike. If all other negotiation processes have failed, then unions will call a strike and laborers, if they agree with the union leadership, will refuse to work.